Okay. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to NJCU's EdTech Doctoral Winter Webinar Series. My name is Melissa Wells. I'm a doctoral student in the Cohort 10 group of NJCU's EdTech Leadership Program. And I'm also the graduate assistant for the department this year as well. So you'll see my face in the beginning of these webinars as your host. So this evening, we're thrilled to have you all here today because we're excited to share some valuable information with you from our doctoral students and also our fellow graduated doctorates that came from our NJCU EdTech Leadership Program. Now, this series is designed to provide you with the latest insights, strategies, and the best practices in technology. So whether you're new to this field or you've been working in it for some time, we believe that you're going to find something of value here in this series. Throughout this series, we'll be covering a wide range of topics and we'll be featuring experts from this technology education field who are they're going to share their knowledge and experience with you. And we'll also be providing you with the opportunity to ask questions and interact with our speakers towards the end of their session. So please feel free to participate in the Q&A sessions. This evening, we are presenting Student Empowerment Through Digital Storytelling presented by Dr. Dana Mason. Now, Dr. Dana Mason is an adjunct professor at NJCU in the ed tech department. She began her career with the Bayonne Board of Education as a high school band teacher, and after eight years became a technology teacher. Dr. Mason holds a Bachelor of Music and Music Performance from New York University, a Master of Arts in Educational Technology from NJCU, where she also earned her doctorate in Educational Technology Leadership. Dr. Mason became passionate about STEAM education after being accepted to the Honeywell Educators at Space Academy, where she earned a scholarship to attend the program at the NASA Training Center in Alabama. There, she completed aspects of astronaut training and STEAM education. The following year, she was accepted to the NASA Advanced Educator Training, where she earned the Commander's Cup Award for teamwork and leadership. Now, Dr. Mason has been presenting at so many conferences in New Jersey, as well as the Space Exploration Educators Conference at the NASA Space Hunter in Houston, Texas. She also had her research featured in various publications and was also selected to teach STEAM education to middle school students in China in 2019. That's awesome. <laughs> now, before I introduce you to Dr. Dana Mason, again, if you have any questions during this presentation, please type them into the question box in your Zoom control panel. Dr. Mason will have time for questions at the end. Now, before I turn this over to Dr. Dana Mason, I'd like to introduce Dr. Samantha Kozer real quick to speak about our programs at the NJCU Ed Tech Leadership Department. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here this evening. We're going to be taking a look just briefly at some of our wonderful programs, which many of you um, are already familiar with. It's nice to see some of our current students and our alumni uh, in attendance here today. So um, as Melissa had um, already mentioned, um, we have uh, some folks here that are uh, that need to be uh, illuminated. We have Dr. Laura Zeger. She's the chair of the Educational Technology Department, and she's a professor. We have Dr. Christopher Schamberg, who's the coordinator of the EDD and Educational Technology Leadership and professor. So if anybody's interested in the EDD, uh, Dr. Schamberg will be your point of contact, and we'll uh, get more into that in just a moment. Dr. Christopher Carnahan is the associate professor of educational technology, as well as Dr. Tracy Amerman, a professor of educational technology as well. And you see everyone pictured here uh, to the left on the screen. Um, I am Dr. Samantha Kozar. I am the STEM Certificate Grant Project Director, and I'm an adjunct faculty member in the department. And Melissa Wells has already introduced herself as a doctoral student, as well as our graduate assistant in the department. So just briefly, we have a Master of Arts in Educational Technology, and that could be done with or without school library and media specialists. And that's 36 credits or 12 classes. It is completely online asynchronous, so it's designed for working professionals. It is project based with no tests. One of our most popular programs is the EDD and Educational Technology Leadership. 
featuring two years of coursework, three years, uh, three semesters, excuse me, year of one being a dissertation year. So you have three total and that one final is your dissertation. Everything is completely asynchronous and online except for one week in mid-July each year, which is our summer institute. And Dr. Schamberg likes to say it is hard fun. And it is a cohort-based program. So you start with people that come in with you and you end with the same people. And it is a model for success. We now offer a STEM certificate. Um, it is completely uh, accredited and as well as a uh, with the New Jersey Department of Education as a certificate program. It is a wonderful precursor to the technology endorsement. It is four classes and 12 credits. It is EDTC 645, 621, 625, and 642. Again, completely online, project-based with no tests or exams. And this certificate has been made possible with generous funding through the Martinson Family Foundation, which emphasizes STEM instruction for K-12 students. The STEM certificate is also available as a part of our Masters of Educational Technology with STEM certificate. So you can actually just get the Masters of Educational Technology with STEM and it's rolled right in. So you learn about incredible emerging technologies, and you can see a lot of them featured here, um, and different and new innovative pedagogical methods in which you can approach instruction. If you have any questions about any of our programs, you can reach Dr. Laura Zieger, who is our department chair at lzieger at njcu.edu, or for the STEM certificate program or the Masters of Arts in Educational Technology with STEM certificate. Uh, to me at scozar at njcu.edu. Thank you so much, everybody, and I hope you enjoy the webinar this evening. Thank you, Dr. Kozar. All right, now without further ado, we will turn the time over to Dr. Dana Mason. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for taking your time to be with us this evening. Amazing. So tonight we are going to talk about um, student empowerment through digital storytelling. And I am so excited because this is a, a, a wonderful way of really giving a cross-curricular approach to what you're doing in your classroom, enhancing 21st century learning, adding on technology, because as we know, just infusing something with technology does not always mean that it, it becomes a 21st century approach, right? We have so many other elements. So we're going to talk about all of that as we go through. Um, if you want, if, if you see at the bottom, uh, the tiny URL that's there, that's some handouts. Feel free to take a, a screenshot of anything you see that could um, help you or jog your memory as you're taking your notes or you know if something um, proves interesting uh, to your particular practice. Um, those handouts are going to be just some, some basic things that are going to pertain to some of the uh, things that we go over tonight. And um, some of it you'll, it'll work and fit right into your to your plan. Other ones, you're going to have to kind of maybe make some adjustments or things um, so that you can modify it to meet the needs of your classes. You guys know your students best. So a lot of what we talk about will give you great ideas and things to get your, your wheels turning and find ways to really customize your educational approach enhanced with digital storytelling. So let's talk about it. What is digital storytelling? This is the art of telling a story through the use of multimedia. It can incorporate the graphics element of technology, video, audio, or web-based publishing. Uh, computer-based tools can also help us with participating in storytelling through computer-based narratives. These are also something that you can use with electronic memoirs or interactive storytelling or digital essays. So um, this graphic at the bottom just happens to be so fitting because it kind of gives a quick glance at all the elements that come to play when you incorporate digital storytelling into your classroom. So I'm going to show you, um, we're going to talk about a couple of things, not only the approach and kind of some how to's to look into for your particular um, classroom, but we're going to, I'm going to give you an example. Now, there is um, so a site called NASA, uh, well, NASA.gov has a lot of educational resources. One faction of it is called NASA Eclipse, and they do a lot of videos that are not only student created, also created by scientists and professionals so that you could use them as videos within your classroom. So a lot of these types of videos and things that are, are incorporated are things that you can layer your approach so that you're telling kids, this is fantastic. We have to learn it. It's really important. This is great. 
okay, but you're the only one telling them. So we, we know that we want to scaffold that a little bit with other things. We want to layer it with different things and have students kind of construct their own understanding. So by doing it with multiple measures or, or necessarily multiple measures, but multiple layered techniques, it's going to build a more solid foundation in their understanding. And they will then themselves have more of a, a relationship and understanding to the, to the core interest that you're talking about, the core um, concepts. So we're going to play this video first, and it's an example of the phases of the moon uh, that's on the NASA.gov website through the NASA Eclipse. This is one version of how a digital story can go. So just watch this, and then we're going to talk quickly about it at the end. Have you ever looked at the moon and it looked close enough to touch or wondered why it doesn't stay the same night after night? Why does it change? I love to look up at the moon at night, especially when it's big and round and bright. But I just found out that the moon's light actually comes from the sun. That's right. All solid surfaces reflect light back to us. The moon reflects light from the sun. The sun emits the light. The moon reflects it back. So the moon doesn't make its own light. It reflects sunlight. But why does the moon change shape every night? The moon doesn't change shape every night. What we see is the moon being lit with different amounts every night. So it appears to change shape, which we call the phases. When the moon is new, there's no sunlight reflecting off of it back towards us. That's why we can't see it. The sun is still shining on the moon, but it's shining on the other side of the moon. And therefore, we can't see it. When the moon is full, the sunlight is reflecting off the full disk of the moon. See it as a full moon. In between those phases, the moon goes through waxing, which is increasing. It's an old word for increasing. Waning, which is an old word for decreasing. It refers to the amount of light on the moon. So as you see the moon go from full, then it gets a little less light. And so it's a waning moon. It goes through waning gibbous, waning half, and waning crescent. Then it's a new moon. You can't see it. There's no light reflecting off of it. And then it'll start to come back slowly. And then we'll go through waxing crescent, waxing half, and waxing nibis. Full moon always rises at sunset. So if you want to see a nice full moon, go out at sunset. After that, the moon rises 50 minutes later each day. So sometimes you'll see it at night, but sometimes you can see the moon during the day as well. The phases of the moon arise because the moon is rotating on its axis. Rotation is when a body rotates around its axis. Both the moon and the earth rotate around their axis. The moon revolves around the Earth, and the Earth revolves around the sun. Whoa, that was some rotation. So the moon, Earth, and sun work together in a system. The phase of the moon depends on how much of the sunlit side of the moon we see as it revolves around Earth. Just like the full moon rises at sunset, the new moon always rises when the sun rises. But we can't see the new moon during the day because the side of the moon the sun is shining on is turned away from the Earth at that time. And that pattern repeats over and over again. Here's something you can do at home. Go outside and look at the moon every day for a couple of months. Draw a picture of what you see, then try making your own calendar that shows the phases of the moon. Before long, you'll be able to predict what phase of the moon comes next. For our world, I'm Mache. See you next time. Oh, look, a waning crescent. <laughs> okay. So, um, NASA Eclipse is a great uh, resource because they have different types of things broken down for grades three to five, six to eight, nine through 12, and of course, student produced production. So um, keep this as a little extra in the back of your head if you're looking for content to support what you're already teaching um, or maybe expand upon your practice that you already have in place. There's not just stuff for science and the planets. There's things for natural science. There's stuff for weather. There are, I found some videos at one point for on math and um, all kinds of great things. So check out stuff that naturally occurs in our world. It really touches on a lot of different things that you're probably going over with your students. And um, it's just a nice benefit to have. The NASA Spotlight student produced videos are pretty cool because you can do this type of a thing in your classroom. And throughout the course of tonight, we're going to go over some of the different uh, ways that you can create a student production of a digital story and really hit on that student empowerment to get your kids um, really acclimating to the 21st century opportunity of, of your classroom. So we're going to talk more about that soon. Um, with the NASA Spotlight, 
they'll vet it for, of course, accuracy and, and making sure if it's on the website as, as a resource, they want to make sure that it's correct. So there are certain um, rules and different types of things that they're going to, to give you as guidance so that you're not produ um, promoting things that you shouldn't be. You know, um, it's got to be fact-based stuff that just talks about, let's say, like the um, teaching something like the phases of the moon. But we will get into some of those details and I'll show you where to find them should something like that be a fit for your classroom. But we're starting really at the top kind of the challenge, the biggest challenge at the Zenith there. Um, we want to make sure that there, you realize too, that there are other versions of creating a digital story and making it accessible at all grade levels. So um, we're going to talk about ideas like that too. So let's uh, go over these basic steps. Um, what I like to do is break stuff down. I'm a list maker. That's really how my brain works well. And I think when I have a step one, step two, things like that, it really helps me break down sub steps and um, gives me structure. I know as I think that way, many of my students also work very well with that type of structure. So if you're going to do some sort of student created either uh, Eclipse or doing just a general type of digital storytelling, depending on what format you choose, these are all steps that'll work with, regard, uh, with your lessons, regardless of the format. So step one, have your teams. I would break kids up into teams. That's what I like to do. Um, it's great when you have the collaborative effort. And that's one of the four C's that's really important here in 21st century learning. So um, that's one of the things you can click off your list automatically by putting them into groups. However, you will have some students that thrive as individuals. And there may be some times where you just want to have that, that individual approach. And that's fine too. So step one, have your teams uh, agree on a topic. This could be a topic that is related to your particular, um, whatever content you've got. You may have, um, if you're teaching about a particular time in history, give them a broad-based thing, let's say maybe it's civil war, and you may have someone focus on um, different types of topics, such as what's the food that they were eating? Um, what's the architecture of the time? Was there music going on at the time? What did people listen to? Did they listen to what we know now? Was it stuff that was from the, you know, a different time period? What, what were the instruments, that kind of a thing. That's a really great thing to focus on. Of course, my background primarily um, was grounded in music. So that's where my mind goes first is to the arts. But there's other things that you can do as well. What were the politics of the time? Maybe important battles. Um, when you're talking about a broad, a broad historical event, such as the Civil War that spanned years, there are many, many different things. You can focus on important generals or, or important people, um, or even the president of the time with Abraham Lincoln. There's many other options that you can focus on. You can have students choose a topic. That's great, especially if they're older. You know your students best. You may want to designate something for them and just kind of uh, hone what they're working on. Or maybe you just want to have them focus on different battles. Each group takes a different battle and talks about where. Was it a North? Was it a South? What was the victories? What were some of the turning points? Um, things like that. So many things to, to consider in that. Uh, allow time for research. So if you're covering it as part of your content within your classroom, this is important content that they're already going to be acclimated to, but you're going to want to allow them to broaden their experience by kind of doing a little research on their own. They're going to need that planning time as well. So as you go to step three, once they have the content, they know kind of what they want to talk about. How are they going to talk about it? Are you just going to blurt it all out? We've got a plan. So that comes in the form of storyboards. Um, you can have them just write a script. You can have them, uh, you know, kind of come out with, an outline of here's the first thing we're going to talk about. Then it flows nicely to this. I like to use uh, Google Slides for this. Uh, many schools are relying on Google, but using a, a slides-based uh, program is great because you can kind of move the slides around as you need to. I don't know about you guys, but if you've ever kind of started planning stuff, does it always come out the exact way that you started the outline? I'm always drawing lines and crossing stuff out. And when you're on a static piece of paper, it looks like a mess. It's very hard, or it's just double work to kind of clean it up later. This allows students to be very creative and kind of move those tiles around and think of it not as a slide presentation, but more of a linear approach to, all right, we talk about this, this, that, and come up with an order that makes sense. From there, they create their detailed script. So if they're um, creating a vignette, maybe, or a story that they're writing themselves, they can act out. You're going to need characters and a script. They're going to need a little time for that. But it might just be narration, which is fine, too. So if students are in front of the camera narrating what they're going to say to, to take people through it, that's kind of what that could look like. Um, there are different versions though how you can do this. You can do an actual slide presentation where students do a voiceover, um, or you can have the narration kind of move across the screen with appropriate music and sounds in the background um, and a visual on the screen where people are reading as things are going through. So depending on what you're looking to do, these are aspects that you have to consider in how you're kind of um, 
guiding your students through this, but a script will be necessary nonetheless, because someone's going to have to either type or say something somewhere. At the end, they're going to rehearse and film. So once they've gone through it enough, they feel pretty confident they're ready to get out there and or right in front of the camera or just right in front of the microphone, whichever it is, they're going to then be able to do their, their actual clips of what they want to do. And then, of course, editing and sharing. So um, one thing that um, has been brought up as a question in the past was, where do I get a video camera where I can do this? We are living in an amazing age because most of our students have this in the palm of their hands. If they use Chromebooks, laptops, iPads, tablets of any sort, there's a camera built in. So they're taking videos all the time between Snapchat and all these different types of things for social media, um, TikTok. If I see another TikTok video, <laughs> I mean, there's so many of them and you can see great stuff that has good content. Some stuff is just silly, but harness the media of the time that these kids are using and really put a nice twist into it and get them to work on making it productive, making it a part of what their, their future could be. Because once they learn how to do this in a productive way, not just for fun, they can make videos and make it look quite professional as time goes on with just a little bit of organization. So part of that organization is we are focusing on the design process and problem solving process. Um, both of these are great. Um, they are somewhat interchangeable. I tend to use them at different times. So I'll explain a little bit about it. The um, problem solving process is the, um, the something that was developed by George Poilia in the 1940s. And um, I got this graphic from code.org. I took a, a summer course with them and that was concurrent through the year. And I loved this. I thought it was really nicely um, succinct. There were four main steps. Define, prepare, try, reflect. I just happened to, I organize things through color. So this also made sense with my type of brain as well. Many kids will just appreciate that they're differentiated in, uh, you know, determined by a different color. And as you move through each phase, each phase could be color coded differently. So as they map out what their process is, they can kind of follow this as well. Kids are constantly craving structure. They'll never admit it. <laughs> you know that, right? All the, they, they want to rail against whatever structure they have, but when they're most productive is when they're, they're following along and they're, they're producing projects and other types of inquiry-based learning and project-based learning following, um, a guidance, a guidance. So you as a teacher facilitating, providing this kind of a structure for them, if you're using it in other types of products, uh, excuse me, in other types of um, experiences in the classroom, they're going to have a product that's based on, okay, here's a step to help me make better decisions and put out better uh, work product. So the first step is define. We all have to define the product, the problem, figure out exactly what it is before we attempt to even solve it or try something new. So we're going to do that first with the definition of the problem. The next one is going to be preparing to solve it. So once we know we have or we feel we have a solid idea in our head, we're going to start to prepare. So that means maybe we're going to ideate some solutions, uh, talk through it with our group. What does that look like? It depends on the product and the group that's working. But then they come together and they kind of come up with a new invention, a new process, a new um like, um, I guess they, they kind of start to come up with a new version of what they're doing. And so as that iterates through, they're going to start to put it to practice. Now they've got their prototype or their, their presumed version of prototype, and they're going to put it into action. But they might just before realize that something is missing or something isn't happening. They may want to go back and forth as they cycle through. So this is not always the full cycle through from try and then reflect where they talk about all the things they reflect what worked, what didn't. Sometimes it brings them right back to the start point and they just keep going through. This model is great because if you look at the gray inner circle of the cycle, it's a non-recursive model. So sometimes you get to prepare and your group is talking about it from what seems to be different angles. It's a little murky. So how many times have we all as educators, as, as students ourselves, gone back and had to read the question again so we knew exactly what we were doing? That's going back and redefining the issue to make sure that you're on point. And then maybe that propels you forward so you're in a stronger position of trying. But you may dance back and forth between some of these steps and that's okay because even if you completely bomb out and you fail on it, it doesn't, it doesn't work the first time. Students are learning that resilience from, okay, well, it doesn't have to be perfect. This is my first time trying it. And the steps show me that I could just keep going and redefining and try again. So we continue to cycle. There's never really an end here until we've determined it. Um, I, I really appreciate that because many kids don't think enough about the reflection and have that resilience built up. If they get a wrong answer, that's it. I'm done. I, I fail. I stink at this. I'm terrible. And all those negative types of words start to set in. Those are not empowering experiences. So we have to remind them every chance that we can that there are structure 
where failure is kind of built in, right? It's not really failure where you have that weighted, you know, negative feeling going on. It's, it's just an opportunity to try it again. Okay. So we know that the first thing we came up with didn't work. How many inventors that were um, innovating on all these great ideas? I mean, think about the light bulb. Do you think that Thomas Edison just popped one of those out and said, hey, everyone has light. There's indoor electricity. Let's tap into it. And, you know, no more candles. You know, you really have to think about that and how far the technology from one, for, from the original light bulb to what we have now with LEDs and all kinds of other exciting inner indoor lighting. We have lights on for Christmas that adorn our houses and different holidays, not even just the ho- like the winter holiday season, but I see things all year round, spotlights. What a luxury compared to when it was invented. And that's all come because people have continued to reinvent the wheel and come up with a better version. So these kinds of, of um, structure will allow them to feel that way and empower them to move forward. I like to use this with my middle school and lower grades. Um, Engineering design process is very similar. It cycles and circles all through it. It adds an additional step. And then eventually it spits out the present solutions, which is great. When you finally have your really good, strong way of doing it, present it. Um, And that's where your final step is there. But you can cycle through as many times. If it doesn't work, that just means you keep going through until you find something that does work and you bring it to present uh, for presentation. Um, The one thing, that when you're looking at the engineering design process, depending on what you're looking for, you can find some with like 12 and 13 steps that are very complicated. I just urge you as you find the model that's right for you and your students, that you really consider simplicity or consider what your students are capable of or what's gonna help them best for the objective of that lesson or that project that you're working on and find something that's not going to overwhelm them, but give them helpful steps as opposed to ones that they might not completely understand how they fit into. So preparing students for the 21st century, I saw, I was fortunate enough to see uh, Sir Kenneth Robinson when he was at the 2020, oh, sorry, uh, 2010 teachers convention in New Jersey. And um, he's, if you don't know him, I highly suggest getting to know him more. He was all about creativity in education and how the arts now have more of a place than ever in 21st century learning, because that's what's helping us bring um, a lot of our innovation at forward. Um, It's also about integrating 21st century learning and through all of the subjects, not just an arts-based approach, but everything can benefit from now integrating what 21st century learning looks like. So he had this amazing quote, how do we educate our children to take their place in the economies of the 21st century, given that we can't anticipate what the economy will look like next week? And for me, that blew my mind. At the time I was, I was teaching high school band. I was like, oh man, that's so true. Think about how how our our um, evolution of, of the job market has changed. Easy pass, right? I think of that as one example. And I talk about this with our students. Some of them don't really understand the idea that when you went through the toll booth, you were searching for change. You almost caused an accident if you, oh man, I forgot to get my change out or if you didn't have a, co- a co-pilot that day, right? Um, and so many people had lost their jobs in one way where, okay, We didn't need human toll collectors. However, we do need technicians. We do need computer specialists and and technicians who are going to not only repair, install, and maintain these systems, but now we also create a bunch of indoor jobs for people. We're going to help with Mount, um, if it doesn't work right, to make sure that they're taking payments, the billing. It's just shifted into a different arena a little bit. So it might not be that jobs are completely obsolete. It's just the type of job and replaced by something that requires more of a 21st century approach. So those are some examples I've discussed with my students, reminding us that we have to find ways even in our own teaching to help bring that 21st century approach in and empower our students to stay open-minded and become lifelong learners. So with digital storytelling, we hit all the different 21st century um, elements. You can see a lot of them in the word cloud up there are um, are provided. And um, so, these are about five elements that I think they really hit home and encompass those 21st century skills. So in digital storytelling, what are you doing in your classroom? You are teaching digital literacy. This is the ability to gather info, discuss issues, um, seek help and use digital tools in a growing community. Global literacy, huge. Many of us, um, especially when when we're kids, it's not their fault. They're learning, right? But we live an ethnocentric life in a way where we think that our little home in whatever town in New Jersey or, you know, somewhere in the United States, it could be anywhere. Right now, that's the big world to them. 
because they're young. So now this opens them up to a global literacy, understanding information on a global perspective that they themselves impact beyond the classroom, beyond their home, beyond whatever it is they're doing that day. They make a global impact. And I think students can now relate to that more than ever because of the nature of social media. For better or worse, it has its, its very positives. It also has its uh, quite our negative side as well. But that's something that that's I'm noticing students are grasping that faster because they're they're able to connect with people from all over. The other concept is visual literacy, understanding and producing, communicating through the use of visual images, which is great. We're going to be doing that with st um, static images and with um, the videos that we create through digital storytelling. And we want to make sure that if a kid is talking about, you know, um, we the people and, and all the stuff of the Constitution, that there's not just a random picture of a chicken up there. What does that have to do with anything? We want to make sure that they're discerning and they're putting up images, not just because it was a really cool looking chicken, you know, we want to make sure that they're putting something that has to do with, let's say, the Constitution or founding fathers um, and different things that are related to the topic that they're presenting forward. You know, there's time to do chicken stuff later, but we want to make sure that if um, something belongs and it's really related to what it needs to be. Technology literacy, using technology to learn and improve personal productivity. Activity. This is huge because, you know, technology has the dark side and the light side, right? We can be addicted to social media and just sit there and never grow. Or we can use this as a, as a means of enhancing our own practice and also going out into the world and, and making sure those connections are made, seeing how it's used in industry, in education, in a variety of fields, or using it assistively so that more people can connect than they ever had, could before. I have family that I know, um, I, 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 we, they live in a different country, a completely different continent. And last time I saw them in person was when I was three. And now, thanks to all of this, uh, like Facebook and whatnot, we keep up. We talk on a weekly basis. It's incredible. And even though we don't always speak the same language because their English is much better than than you know my version of their their um, their language is, it's difficult because um, I have to use a, a translator. But I can do that still. So I can still talk to my cousins and my relatives and have, a, you know, they can pretty much understand what I'm talking about. And we're learning and, and growing together. That's all because of technology. So having that that literacy and knowing how to use it productively and not relying on it just for, you know, the addictive purposes, it's a good balance to, to have in your life. And that's a great thing that digital storytelling prepare students with because there's plenty of offline work that's continuing or work that doesn't rely on just standing in front of the camera. There's research, there's other things, and it's more of a healthy process. Information literacy, hugely important because we're evaluating and synthesizing various forms of information. It could be fake news, right? There's just because it's on the internet, some kids don't quite grasp that there's no filter for the internet. There are fact checkers and people, sure, you know, but you just never know. I mean, anyone could post something up there. I, any one of us can pick a random fact without researching it and post it either on social media, on a website that we create. Websites are pretty much free now. So you can do a Google site if you have a Google account. Um, you can slap a domain name on it and it, you can make it look really official if you're pretty savvy. Doesn't mean that it's correct. So we have to also remind our students that they have to discern and know how to, how to find a good source. Uh, vet it against other sources before they reproduce it or reshare it, and uh, that there's great responsibility in how be they behave online in their own digital citizenship. So we're going to talk about some ideas now, how to get started with um, with what you are working on in digital citizenship. Um, sorry, not digital citizenship. Of course, that's also an element of this as well. As you know, we're going to talk about that as we go through. But this is with the um, idea of um, digital storytelling. First kind of thing you can do is a misconception video. Since we were just talking about the idea of internet fake news, right? We can tackle that. Kids love the idea of um, like Mythbusters or putting something out there. Oh, so-and-so said this, or, or, you know, I heard this quote, whatever, from a student of mine, or, you know, they talked about, you know, if, if you, different myths and things that kids talk about or something they may have overheard or something on, um, on Facebook or social media, whatever they're exposed to, they can tackle a misconception. It could be related to a historical event. It could be related to a scientific event or, or process. Um, they can even make a claim, their own hypothesis, and look to prove themselves right or wrong and go through that process with taking their audience through them with, okay, well, I'm not sure if this really happens. Let's check it out. You know, um, how did Newton come up with gravity? Well, you could do it as a myth buster kind of thing. Did people disagree that gravity existed, yes or no, and go through all these different steps as to what's the evidence for it. And so that evidence-based thing can, uh, um, project can allow them to get through the misconceptions and kind of promote fact through a very innocent um, and productive, um, like research-based journey. 
There's also the information informative historical video. So an example I used earlier, like using the Civil War or a time period, you can definitely do something like that if you teach um, history. However, you don't have to just teach history. The great thing is that in any subject you teach, whether it be math, whether it be art, music, um, language arts, anything, uh, geography, there's history. The maps are not the exact same as they were hundreds of years ago. We, As we learn more, we do better. We know more. So as that continues to happen, because we're always going to be lifelong learners, these, these types of things, we get new information. So having that is really important in any field. We, all, we know that the way they taught science 100 years ago was not the same thing because we know more. Same thing with a lot of the other subjects. Uh, if it's math, you could talk about the, the fathers of math, like Pythagoras and some of these amazing mathematicians that gave us our, our first thoughts. And the people that that got us to the moon did so with a slide ruler. They didn't have the computerization that we have today. So, you know, there are different aspects of history that we can consider in any field. So that's always a great topic. Public service announcements. I like these too. Um, <laughs> so pre-COVID, I think the year before, it was one of the worst um, flu times I think that I had experienced as a, a teacher. We were getting some really rough flu. Um, and they were definitely the flu. Kids went in, they, they got tested for the flu, and that's what it was, and they were out for a week or so. So we were trying to help students have better attendance rates because there was no option for virtual or anything. So we were coming up with uh, scripts and things to, to do um, a PSA on how to, how, to do, um, how to keep yourself healthier. So we had kids interacting, not sharing drinks, not sharing things at the lunch table, wiping down surfaces when you're done, being neat and clean, how to wash your hands by singing the ABCs twice, all that kind of stuff. We were putting into place a little early. Um, we were using sanitizer. We did the, the vampire cough. We, we did a cute little thing like that around Halloween. So, you know, cough like Dracula into your shoulder, not on your hands and go touch someone. Things like that were great. Um, so those types of public service announcements were, were wonderful. We were going to put together a little um, school page, right, with a student created videos or little scenes of them acting, you know, healthily or, or making sure that they're washing their hands properly like that so that they would be able to show information about that and share that with their the students in their schools. I teach in a K through eight and it was great because we had some of the older kids interacting with the younger kids in a very um, like a lovely way. They were really helpful. They were like peer leaders and the little ones were learning from them and interacting in our videos as well. But it was nice to see those other kids step up as leaders within their school community. Um, another thing, too, is an introductory video. So um, this is great if you have any new student coming anywhere or you just want to talk about some, some pride that you have for your neighborhood, your school, your city, um, and talk about a welcome to our school. Um, talk about, you know, introductory for yourself, describing who you are. I know there's a school in our district that um, houses a primary, a primary amount of, they have neighborhood kids as well, but kids that come that are learning English, they're the bilingual school designation. So those students are there until their, their English skills are strong enough where they can go into their neighborhood school. And it's amazing the magic that happens there. But there's kids coming at all different times of the years because some are refugees, some are, are just coming from different countries. It was their time or they're they're able to migrate now. And, you know, that doesn't always happen at September and, and in June. So many kids come in mid-year and feel like, oh, I have no friends. I don't know what I'm doing. I barely speak the language. What am I, what am I going to do? You know, this is a new scary thing. So you can have other students participate in welcome videos and have the other students participate in welcome videos or, or maybe like an introduction video of who they are. Um, to, if they're if they're not from America yet, maybe they can, and they're they're learning English and they're they're still kind of assimilating. They can talk about their country and teach their classmates a little bit about what they've learned or where they've come from. Things like that could be incredibly powerful because they're not the kid that can't speak English yet, or they're not the kid that isn't from here yet. But everybody has value, and everyone is something that they can learn from one another. This just gives them a different type of platform and meets them right where they are. The scripted score story. I love this too, because you've always got a kid who's a playwright in the back that, that is going to write their next novel and you know you'll be seeing them on the shelf in the near future or maybe possibly across a stage somewhere. And um, they're going to want to write all these different things and, and cast actors and actresses and, and really do a production. This is great. Have them find a topic or maybe have it, you know, give them the freedom of that. If you're doing a historical video, maybe they want to do a scripted story or do something based on the novel you're doing in your classroom or a, a time period in history, a different take on what's happening, like a historical fiction. They can definitely do that and showcase a lot of the important things that you want them to learn in your class through that video, through this fictional uh, story that they're creating. So that's a really full, full circle um, experience for that student.
Another one is an advertisement. Kids love to talk about marketing and advertisement and they want people to buy stuff. Well, why? Okay, what, what are those um, hooks that, that they have in marketing that make certain advertisements more successful? Is it the product itself that's always better? Or is it sometimes the marketing campaign that's much more successful? So you can go at it on a lot of different levels. What I've done in the past was um, when I try to teach some STEAM classes, I'll give them a, a bag of junk. That's what I call it. It's maybe a paper bag or it could be smaller, it could be larger. Sometimes it's a Ziploc bag of random items. It could be like dollar store, cheapy little plastic spiders, whatever the heck I got. And I get creative about what I put in each bag and I hand them out randomly to the groups that I have in my school, my classes. And those kids then are using just the bag of junk, have to create their own product, show me, present how it works, and then come up with a marketing, name it, give me a price point, and then do a marketing campaign. And that's their digital story is their advertisement for their bag of junk created uh, invention. So that's something that's a lot of fun also. Um, and kids get really excited about that, especially when they learn those pieces. And it makes them more savvy too, because as they go out into the world, they're going to see more advertisements. And now they're going to look at it and say, oh, okay. So um, yeah, they're preying on, you know, they're using, uh, what is it? The bandwagon approach. Maybe they're doing repetition here. Like what are the techniques so that they're more savvy to it? And they can think, all right, do I need this product or don't I? Am I going to eat McDonald's because I really want McDonald's? Is it my choice or are they trying to hook me into it? Whatever. It could be any, you know, product. Uh, and sometimes it's, yeah, no, I really want that Big Mac. Great. <laughs> that's that's your choice. But looking through the the veil of, of marketing is also very important so they could be savvy. How-to videos. I could talk about a how-to video forever, but I don't want to do that today. So I'm just going to give you the highlights of what I love about this. Um we had, I had a teacher who was amazing in seventh grade and that was back in the late nineties. So he made us all do how to videos. The problem at the time was in the late nineties, not many people in our neighborhood at, at all really had, um, video cameras. There were two kids in an entire class of 26. And I remember saying, how am I ever going to get this done? I don't even know what I'm supposed to do. I'll give a presentation. They said, nope, nope. You have to make a video. So here I am stressing. Well, what it forced us to do was collaborate. It had us making friends with the kids who could do the filming who had one and their parents allowed them to come and, you know, had to work it out. And like, all right, yes, of course you can go to so-and-so's house and film this at this time. No problem. One kid did all the different stro swimming strokes because we learned that that student was on the, the swim team. How awesome. And they learned what the difference was. Then another one was um, some other kid taught you how to make um, some sort of, you know, family recipe for something, which was cool because they did it like a, like a cooking show. Another kid showed you how to tie your shoes with a really creative twist that you never would have thought. And this was seventh grade. So, you know, then one kid was like, I'm going to show you how to make Campbell's tomato soup. And everyone was like, really? You're just opening up a can? At first, we weren't sure how that was going to go. We're like, it's kind of simple. But halfway through, what we didn't realize is that student knew how to use a manual can opener. And most of us had the electronic ones. So, if the electricity was out, we wouldn't know what to do. So it was amazing. That kid was king overnight because he could use a real can opener. <laughs> it was a big deal. But these unexpected elements that you take for granted just kind of surface. And that kid all of a sudden went from, oh, I'm just going to do what I can do because this is in my capability to I have a skill that no one else has. And that was really special for that student. And of course, the last thing is a book review, a product review. Um, in times of social media, everybody loves to give their opinion. <laughs> we know that that's almost addictive, right? Someone's got to always tell you how they think, whether you asked for it or not. In this case, you can ask your students for it and confidently receive their reviews. They can create a video about that um, in any sort of thing that they're doing. You can have it for, um, you know, a, why are they, is it something that might be related to an item historically too? Like thinking back to the Civil War, what was an invention that was, amazing at that time? Or what was a play that, you know, uh, what was it? American Cousin? Isn't that the, the play that Lincoln had gone to? Maybe it was something of that time and they're going to do a review on what they think that that particular experience was. Whatever their choice is, um, that's fine. They could do a review on it. Um, it's great for language arts. You can do a lot of great things with this. If, when, if, just use your creativity. Um, one thing to remember though, if you're using it with NASA Eclipse, you can't do a product or book review to submit to them. They just won't accept it. So um, just know that going in so you don't get your kids excited. They do a review, they submit it, and NASA's like, well, that's nice, but you know, the rules. Um, they just don't want anyone trying to sway someone's opinion. They're very fact-based in what they allow for their um, submissions. Okay. Um, this is a very cross-curricular approach. I've kind of alluded to this along the way, but these are some things that I really think are, are very viable and valuable to uh, mention. Digital storytelling is used for any subject. 
anything. You just have to be creative. Um, think about your process, think about your, your um, content, and it's a project-based approach to um, integrating whatever concepts you'd like your students to really practice and massage out. Um, it's not just little ones or it does exclude the little ones either is what I should say. Pre-readers to high school, you can really do some great things. Um, what's wonderful is that some of these students are going to be independent enough to have a challenge where they're more, they're working on their own or they're working independently with a group. However, the little ones like pre-readers, for example, you can do a digital story where maybe they're learning their alphabet. So each little pre-K kid can color their letter. You can make a little worksheet for them. They talk about the letter. They read a word that is associated with it. They, they show you a picture of something that they drew that's all associated with that letter. You can take a bunch of mini clips of videos and splice them all together and put together a nice digital story that takes someone rocking through the alphabet, put some music in the background, have them dance it out, get excited. Um, that encourages each student. And there's almost a letter for everybody. If you have classes, usually early childhood is under 26 letters. So you can even double up sometimes. Uh, get the aides involved, the teachers, some people around the school, be creative and just, or even some of the older students, if they have siblings or someone that comes and helps out in the classroom, you could get everybody involved in this. And it's a really nice project. It doesn't end there, but I'll let you come th think of your own ideas, but uh, you can really do great things with the little ones. And um, it gets them, give them the, gives them the confidence to have that live experience while you can still re re um, record, find the best one if they're having a hard time expressing right away and they're learning to uh, develop this new skill. They're not right in front of a huge audience. Along with the use of digital technology, um, digital storytelling is a medium of expression for students to showcase their skills. So um, again, you may have students, if they're doing introductory things, uh, they might make an introductory video. And I know that when I have had kids in my classroom, okay, stand up, tell us your name, tell me a thing about you. It's great. It's effective. But sometimes it gets a little boring because every kid's like, my name's Dana Mason and I'm in technology. I play clarinet and I sit down, you know, then the next kid, they're rushing through it. There's that social pressure that sometimes you don't get enough out of it. They're doing it out of an obligatory thing and they're a little nervous about what's happening. So, um, you know, you, you get what you get, but when you give them the opportunity to maybe express themselves or do a video, they have that time. They're kind of private at home. You might, they might do it in their bedroom. They might do it in the living room. They might, I know one kid I saw had a guitar on the back of the wall and he was talking about some things and how he took some guitar lessons. He's looking around his room and he's getting inspiration on what he could share about himself. He, this other kid showed a sculpture that they did. I had no idea that kid did sculpture. Amazing. But I could also use that as I start to, in, to empower that kid and help him utilize his talents in other future things. Um, like, groups or projects that we're doing, because I know that kid has a background in X, Y, Z. Um, so that's really great. Sometimes you get a little more than you experience, expected, and they're willing to open up because they don't have that social pressure of the audience of peers immediately. Um, student leadership, of course. This is something that I think is great because there's incredible amount of uh, independent study that's going on as they're developing and growing. But when students are willing to share what they know, they emerge as thought leaders and develop their confidence to thinking big, and they're empowered by the impact that they make in their community. And that's a huge thing. Not Students aren't always in the position where they realize that or have that experience to go through. So this is a really unique opportunity where you can provide that for them and they can do more on their own and really feel that they're making a positive impact. So digital storytelling allows for all types of differentiated instruction. So this is a response to intervention, three tiers of support through RTI. So a tier one would be core classroom, bare minimum. This is what everybody's learning no matter what. So this is where everybody falls. And um, maybe a digital story on tier one might just be a slideshow. That's a digital slideshow. It might have someone doing um, some sort of um, like uh, having them type different things in so that the, the words and the narration scrolls or appears in the screen. There's music in the background. There's different things occurring where you're getting the message, but there's no one standing in front of the, the camera. That doesn't have to be. It could be something like a digital slideshow in a different sort of way. So that is also a digital story, as long as it's conveying the information that you intended to. You also have the targeted small group instruction, which brings us to tier two. Tier two might be the next level of challenge for the kids who could do a little bit more. So maybe these kids are doing a voiceover on their slideshow, or maybe they are starting to record certain types of snippets and take video and put it all together. Um, tier three would be the kids who can do maybe even more. They really need that extra challenge so that, you know, they could do tier two in their sleep. Great. Let's give them something to really 
rock and roll. Um, I, I had a friend who did claymation. So as one of her projects, when she was back in school, and this of course was years ago, she wanted to do a claymation video because she did sculpting. So like I mentioned, that kid that was that that uh, showed us his sculptures, that might be something that I think of for him if this is an area where he feels strongly, um, where he has, has different types of a skill. You can challenge them in different ways. Maybe they're going to write a play, act it all out. Maybe they're going to try a green screen in the background and really drop in a background and do something that would be significantly tier three. You might not know how to do that as a teacher, but there's enough where you can learn to allow them to explore. You might not have to know every single element of the technology side of it, but finding the tutorials, being a facilitator, you can encourage them to continue learning these new things as well. So don't be freaked out if it's, I'll never be able to do a green screen. What are you talking about? How am I going to teach the kids to do it? We'll talk about that later. So if you have those feelings right now, just put that to the side. This is important because you're giving them that freedom and that opportunity to be met wherever they are and still have that same element of challenge. So these are seven elements of digital storytelling. And um, you try to get as many of these in to one particular uh, digital story. That's how you know it's as a quality. So it's almost like a, a complete checklist. Um, point of view is something to consider. So what's the main point of view of the story and the perspective of the author? A dramatic question, um, a key question that keeps the viewer's attention, and that's going to be answered at the end of the story. So, you know, that's great with the Mythbusters kind of thing or putting out a hypothesis and then coming full circle. But a lot of that you'll see, too, comes in different types of um, stories and shows that we're watching on television. There's a challenge that's presented in the first couple of minutes, and by the end of the episode, it's resolved in some sort of way or taken to a new level. So that's kind of exciting. Emotional content. This is great too, because some issues that people can relate to, they come alive in a personal way. It becomes a very powerful connection for the audience to the story, and that really draws you in. So if you're able to have that emotional content be impactful, that's something for your students to really consider. Who is the audience and what's gonna make them wanna see my video about this topic? You're the gift of your voice. So a way to personalize your story is going to help the audience connect and understand differently. Now, I'm not saying share all your, your personal business. Not everybody wants to hear that. Not everyone wants to share that. But if there's something that makes you in a unique position to have had an experience where you traveled to a place and you can appreciate how, you know, this historical event unfolded because you got to go there and visit it, talk about it. Give it your personal voice because there's nothing more interesting than a story that someone else has to say. The power of soundtrack. My music teacher heart is so excited about this one. Um, so I'm a huge Star Wars fan, as you'll soon learn about me. <laughs> but um, one of the things I love is when I would go to the to the theater and I'm waiting to see Star Wars in the theater. I'm so excited. The theater's black and I'm sitting in my chair and I'm anticipating those first few notes. And all of a sudden, okay you get the idea star wars enters the room but it jolts you out of the seat and i'm excited and there's a sense of victory and yeah we're gonna do this and then all of a sudden who comes across the street screen darth vader you know all this stuff is happening and you know it's evil in the room so why do we know that there is actually, there are, there are books and books that composers will tell you about where it's almost a science. It's, it's very creative, but in the sense that if I want someone to be scared, I have these four options or these several options to evoke mystery, to evoke, you know, I want, I'll put a, um, a sixth chord in there if I want, if I want mystery, if I want victory, French horns are going to play, you know, major fifths and that's going to feel great. Um, if I want to have a minor third, that's going to be a little, you know, murkiness, sadness, minor sound. There's different types of scales and chords and elements of music that are going to bring that power of the soundtrack in. Now, your students are not going to be scoring them. Well, maybe they will. You just never know. Maybe they're in that that tier one that really needs that challenge. But if they're um, just a kid that's trying to get through this project, they're not going to necessarily be doing that, but they're going to have to choose music that's going to make that impact. So if they're talking about, you know, the death count of the Civil War, they're not going to be playing Happy Birthday in the background. Let's be realistic. So making those types of connections are very, very important. And having those students be aware of the economy of, or the uh, use of music and how that affects the user. That's really, really powerful. Um, economy. And the next one that's super huge. Just enough content to tell the story without overloading the viewer. You know, people, we've all met them, right? Some of us are very, more verbose than others. Myself, I tend to be quite verbose. I love to chat. I love to talk with people. So, you know, there are people that will go on and on and on and on and on. It's like, all right, enough. Death by PowerPoint, death by speeches. I get it. Leave me alone. And then some people will say something and you'll be like, 
uh, can you give me more to go on something like you want to pull it out of them right so these are some things to consider economy not too much not too little uh pacing the rhythm of the story and how slowly or quickly it progresses you've ever had a movie that starts off really slow and it's like oh god the first 20 minutes man that really took a while but once i got to halfway point i loved it it was exciting to the end or some that really hit you in the front with all this excitement and action and then you're like okay now where am i and maybe it slows down the pace changes so that's in regards to pacing so having that rhythm is important okay so now we're up to the part where we talk a little bit about some of the um, technology options. Now, um, some stuff has changed because, you know, technology is always changing. So there's always going to be more. This is not a complete list of every possible um, student video editing app that's out there. But it's just some to get you started as you continue to explore this on your own. So um, the first thing I want to mention here is uh, WeVideo, Magisto, Animoto, Movavi, Filmora Go, you can use Flip, you can use a Screencastify, depending on what you're doing. Um, some of those are on there too. iMovie is great. This chart, if you want to take a picture of it, will be a really helpful start. Because if you are if you choose to or not use some of these, there are things to consider. What platform is it? Is it web-based? Does Is it something you install on a device? Do you need a computer lab? Can it be used on a student Chromebook? Um, is it an app on a mobile device? What type of technology are you using in terms of a device? Is it what platform? Is it a Chromebook? Is it Windows? Is it Mac? Does it like how does that work? So finding ones that are accessible to all, or if they apply to Windows or just Mac, or you can get them from the Play Store. Where is it offered, and how do you how do you get it? Right? Then is there a cost? That's what it always comes down to for us teachers, right? We could come up with the most amazing things, but then we also have to fit within budget. So certain ones um, are free completely. Yay, we love free. <laughs> but also there can be limitations with free. So there may be other ones that allow your students to do more editing or have a little better experience with it. Um, I know we've used WeVideo um, for, there was a, I think a free trial. So you could always test that out. But um, something that might be $4.99 per person, if you only have four or five accounts for a classroom that you want to use as general accounts for this type of a thing, Magisto is your, your deal. Um, you can get a basic Enomoto for $60 a year. Some of the pricing may have changed recently, but even we video is two ninety nine a year for one class of thirty students. That really helps a lot. Um, now you might not have two ninety nine, but maybe you can talk to your department or your principal or the PTA might be able to help. Um, there are funding options through GoFund, not GoFundMe. I mean, you could do that too. But um, like um, donors choose and some of those other options where you can and can have it. Uh, like uh, purchased for you through clear the list. If you're going for any sort of outside funding or anything, please always ask the permission of your administrators because there are different um, things that you have to consider for all of that before you do um, any particular major purchases or ask for funding. That's you know a district thing. Many times things have to be approved. So you can find different ways, but there are definitely grants and other things out there. Oops, there's one more, hold on. Oops, let's go back. Um, you can take a picture of this page. This, when you have a chance, go through all these apps. There are some great film editing programs that'll be in addition to the ones that I just showed. Um, you can use Flip. One thing I like to itemize here, in addition to the ones we talked about, is Cornell Notes. Um, a lot of times this helps with organizing thought, putting things together, and making sure that um, students kind of lack note-taking sometimes because we're doing so much digitally. They're used to watching videos. So the art of note-taking and organizing that is definitely something that they can benefit from with uh, Cornell Notes. It's a free program. Check it out. And then there's a green screen tutorial. Please take a picture if that helps as well. Um, there are so many you can just put them into uh, YouTube and come up with a million. You might not know how to green screen, but you could put, you know, for a trip to the dollar store and $2, you can come up with a, a you know, one of those party um, tablecloths and put something trans uh, opaque behind it because they're a little translucent and you can have your kids start dabbling with it. You can actually invest in, you know, canvas and a screen, which is also great, but a lot of these online tutorials will help you take your students through it or have your students kind of go through it as well based on the project product that they're using for their editing. And that takes us to the end. So I want to thank you all um, and wish you the best of luck as you start doing these types of products, uh, projects with your student, your family and your, your family, your students, <laughs> maybe your family too, because there's a whole lot of fun you can have with your kids and, and your relatives with this kind of stuff too. But um, if you'd like to check out some more information, I try to do some general stuff on the steamlearninglounge.com. And that's always a growing site with uh, some other things. If you ever need help, you can check out the um, forum there. And, and there's a lot of people that are chatting and sharing their ideas as well. So thanks so much.
Okay, everyone, um, it seems that we're running out of time. So I'm sorry if we could not get to questions, like we only have about one more minute left. Um, but if you, again, if you have any other questions, you could please um, email uh, Dr. Dana Mason. I know she gave you all the information at the end. Okay, all right. Um, Dr. Mason, thank you so much. This was such an informative, great presentation. I mean, I learned so much, you know, I'm a music teacher, so um, these projects are really gonna help me in my classes. <laughs> Awesome. Oh, I'm so happy. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks for having me and good luck for a great year ahead. Uh, NJCU Ed Tech Department appreciates everyone being here. So please be sure to check out what else is going on in the Ed Tech Department for we always have many events taking place. Um, you guys know that you can follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook at Educational Technology Department at NJCU. And again, guys, thank you so much for joining us today and we will see you next time. Thank you, everyone.